Our entire unit has more or less been based on this one short film, this one video, um, which you can find by going to ericwornquist.com. He's Eric Wernquist is the guy that made it. Um, slash Wanderers, and it will bring you here. And click on the far left tab to watch the film. And then if you click the one tab over, the gallery, um, he talks about what he put into each of the different scenes. So this film is basically broken up into about 15 different scenes. And throughout this unit, we have gone pretty in depth on about six of them. But the rest of them, you guys probably still don't know what's going on too well. So I'm just going to give you quick crash course on what's going on in the other scenes. Real quick, I want to address infringement. Obviously, I didn't create the Wanderer short film, Eric Bernquist did, and I'm using it extensively. But for the high school physics class that I'm student teaching for, I did create an entire unit on space science that's based around the film. I'll link to the videos of those lessons in case you're interested. Anyway, I'm not trying to infringe. I won't just be reading the text from the galleries. I'm expounding on the science of each of these places and answering questions for my students. On the off chance that Mr. Vernquist ever sees this, please know that I'm a huge fan and I'll take this video down in a heartbeat if you want me to. But I hope you'll at least take a look. I'm not trying to infringe. I'm trying to supplement a small something to your amazing work. Thanks. Very first scene. This is taking place on Earth. So basically the idea here is this is thousands of years ago when there were still nomadic wanderers, tribes of humans wandering around. Um, so you can see some of them down in the foreground here. And then in the sky you can see all the naked eye planets. So that's all of the planets that you can see without binoculars or a telescope of some sort. So this is Mercury, Venus, Earth is where we are, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And this also has to do with the name of the film. The name Wanderers works on like three different levels. Pretty much the word planet comes from the Greek word for wanderer. Like back for years and years, we never had any way of knowing that planets weren't just stars. We thought that planets were just bright stars. But the other interesting thing about them was that they moved. Like over the weeks and the months and the years, these things move through the constellations because the planets are moving in their orbits. And so they called these moving stars wanderers, planets. Um, and then also, if you listen to the voiceover, that's Carl Sagan, again, the guy from the original Cosmos series, right? He's talking about humans as wanderers. One of his lines is something to the effect of, your life or your bands or even your species might be owed to a restless few who are driven by a desire they can hardly articulate or understand um, to new lands and new worlds. And he argues that basically this desire that we have to wander, to explore, is like an evolutionary adaptation. It legitimately is. If we didn't have this desire, our species probably would have gone extinct by now. For example, there was about 70,000 years ago at that point, there were a few million humans, and there was a huge super volcano, the Toba eruption, and it caused volcanic winter and killed off tons of species and almost killed off the human species. After that um, eruption, there were only a few thousand humans left. If we hadn't spread around to like a certain area in particular, the human species would have gone extinct there. So, like, literally, this desire that we have for exploration, which is also, like, what drives science, like, literally has saved our species and will save our species again in the future. It's not something you need to worry about on, like, the time scale of the human life, so you guys don't need to worry about this, but thinking, like, from a reference frame of the human species, like, eventually there will be another super volcano eruption or another asteroid hits Earth like the one that killed off most of the dinosaurs. And if that doesn't happen five billion years from now, the sun is going to become red giant and swallow the Earth. Like, eventually, if the human species is going to survive in the really, really long run, we're going to have to leave Earth. So that's what we're doing. We're going to have to leave Earth not only for the survival of the human race in the long run, but also because we have this desire for exploration. Like. That's what drives science. We should do this now, not because we need to do it now to survive, but also because like, we should go out to do science and to explore. And it's just, it's our human nature. We need to explore, and space is what's next. Yeah, it's hard to articulate, like he says, but there's something about it. Anyway, next scene is leaving home. We talked about this scene to a pretty good extent. Um, this is an actual photograph of the Earth taken from the International Space Station. And again, he's a computer graphic artist, so he just layered in 
um, this spaceship that he designed here. And we talked about the spaceship design with its um, components that rotate and how that creates artificial gravity. This is the great red spot on Jupiter. A couple interesting things about that is that it's at least 300 years old. That was the first time anyone spotted this great red spot. It's actually been shrinking. Since about 1970, it's been getting much, much smaller. When it was this size, as it's depicted here, you could fit two Earths in here with room to spare. This thing is huge. But it's been shrinking drastically, and it's possible that within a few decades or centuries, um, it's going to be gone. Like, why is it going to shrink? It's basically just a hurricane. Like, hurricanes don't last forever. It happens to be a very strong, very powerful hurricane on a huge planet, so it's lasted a long time, but it's not going to last forever. Yeah. Does Jupiter have a solid surface, or is it like... There this? is a solid core in the very center, but the vast majority of it's just gas. So anyway. Really dense yeah. gas or something? Um, it gets pretty darn dense in the lower layers, yeah. Anyway, if you guys ever get a chance to look through a decent telescope and see Jupiter's great red spot, you should do it, because there's a chance that in a couple of decades you won't be able to see it anymore. This is one of Saturn's moons called Enceladus. You guys have any guesses as to what's going on with this red spot here? Those are geysers. Geysers of liquid water. And then they end up like freezing and falling back onto the moon as snow. So that put water on the moon? Yeah, and that is incredibly important because in our search for life elsewhere in the universe, like the most important criteria that a planet or a moon or something has to have we think in order for life to be there is liquid. The thousands of chemical reactions that are happening inside your body right now can only happen because they're happening in aqueous solutions. If your body weren't full of water, then these reactions wouldn't be possible and life wouldn't be possible. When we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe, the first thing we look for is liquid of some sort. And Enceladus has a lot of liquid. It's really cold, so most of the liquid at the surface freezes into this really thick layer of ice. But we know that there's liquid ocean underneath because it's so close to Saturn that Saturn's gravity is constantly pushing and pulling on it, keeping the core of it warm. Um, and so there's liquid under there, and sometimes it works its way up through cracks and comes out as geysers. How long did it take us to do Several years. With current technology. Yeah, that's definitely one of the first places we're going to want to go um, when we start wandering around the solar system because it's possible there might be some sort of microbial life living in the oceans underneath the ice. What's going on here? What do you think this is? Saturn. Yeah. yeah, this is in the rings of Saturn. A lot of people think the rings of Saturn are like these solid disks of some sort. It's basically just like this mess of effectively snowballs. Like, we're pretty darn sure that the vast majority of the material in Saturn's rings is water, ice. Saturn's gravity probably had hold of some sort of moon that got too close, and then Saturn's gravity ripped that moon apart into the rings. This yeah, astronaut is just hanging out inside of Saturn's Saturn has, Saturn has some serious gravity. Oh yeah. We talked about this one extensively. The elevator on Mars, space elevators, you guys know what's going on here. Yeah. This one, like, for the most part I've just been talking about the science of what's going on here, and, but a lot of his explanations, if you read this stuff, is about like the graphic, the artistry of it here, and the artistry of this one is very interesting. This is an actual photo of Mars, which you can see right here. This is a collage of pictures taken by, I believe, the Opportunity Rover. So it took a bunch of pictures and we stuck them all together to be able to see this big landscape. This is a real place. And then he just came in and superimposed um, these astronauts and everything on here in what he thought was the correct scale. After he finished this, um, he ended up learning that his scale was off a tiny bit. So if someone were actually standing on this real cliff, um, they would be just a little bit taller than they're shown to be here. This next one is a sunset on Mars. And sunsets on Mars are blue. That would be so cool. That would be so cool. Why is so basi that? Yeah, basically what determines like the color of the sky and the color of sunsets is something called Rayleigh scattering. And it also depends on what kind of elements are in the atmosphere. So here on Earth, our atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, um, and that ends up resulting in blue skies during the day and kind of reddish sunsets. But first of all, Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere at all, and what atmosphere it does have um, is primarily carbon dioxide, which results in a daytime sky that's kind of this yellowish green looking thing that you see here. And sunsets that are and again, this is another actual photograph. 
This is an actual photograph from one of, I think this was Spirits, the Spirit rover that is actually on Mars took this photograph of an actual Martian sunset. This is what it looks like. And he just superimposed some astronauts at the right scale sitting on that rock there watching the sunset. This one, again, we've talked about to a certain extent. Other interesting things about it is this is one of the moons of Saturn. And interestingly enough, we've discovered that it has this huge ridge that runs along its equator. And for various reasons, it's going to be advantageous to build settlements on like really high places. This would be a great place to wow. build a settlement in the future. At this scale, this dome here is a kilometer tall. This is a crazy huge settlement. Millions of people who live there. Um, and again, you might think that this is totally unrealistic and not possible, but first of all, the gravity on this moon is very, very low, and so the ceiling wouldn't weigh all that much, the dome wouldn't weigh all that much. And second of all, you're going to have to pressurize the dome, you're going to have to put air in there so that we can breathe, and so that air pressure is going to help hold the dome up. You might think that it would be best to build this at the highest point on that ridge, um, but it turns out that the highest point on this ridge is on the other side of the moon. Iapetus is tidally locked with um, Saturn, just like our moon is tidally locked with us. What that means is the, the moon does spin on its axis, but it spins exactly once per orbit, so the same face of the moon is always facing the planet. And so that means basically the tallest point on this ridge is on the other side, the side that never sees Saturn. So if you want to get a view of Saturn while you're living on Iapetus, you're going to want to build it on this ridge where you'll always see Saturn hanging out in this exact same spot in the sky. Again, this is one of the ones that we talked about extensively. This is a huge asteroid up in the asteroid belt somewhere. It looks like we just built this little colony on the outside, but then if you go to the next scene, they also hollowed out the inside of that same asteroid, which is what this is. And we've talked about it extensively. You hollow it out, you pressurize it, and then spin it going to have centrifugal force keeping you stuck to the outside as artificial gravity and you can build an entire world. Spinning it would that take a few hours of time? Once you get it started, it's just an object in motion tends to stay in there. That's the second question. How are we going to hollow it out? Yeah. <laughs> that would be a huge engineering feat. Like this one, we might be several centuries away from hollow. It is, again, totally feasible. Huge thing of dynamite. What's going on in this one? This moon that these people are trekking across here is Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, which again is covered in water ice, so again is one of the, probably the first places that we're going to go um, to look for life. This is one of Jupiter's other moons, Io, and Jupiter just looms huge in the sky here. So this scene was inspired by another actual photograph right here. This is an actual photo taken by a probe as it was flying past Jupiter. And you can see Io in the foreground here, and Jupiter is just... Is that moon like as big as our thumb was? Uh, no. Europa is a pretty big moon. I believe that one is a little bigger than Mercury, actually. But I'm pretty sure Io is fairly small. This scale might kind of make it look like Jupiter would just like take up half of the sky, right? But in these pictures, the idea is the camera is really far away and it's just zoomed in really far. So yes, Jupiter would be huge in the sky. Jupiter would look about 38 times as large as the moon looks to us, but um, it would be taking up quite half the sky. And then this is Titan. Again, this is one of the scenes that we talked about extensively and why you'd be able to fly around on Titan. And the other interesting thing is that it has these seas or lakes of liquid methane. It ends up having a methane cycle just like we have a water cycle. So methane is going to evaporate from these seas and form clouds in the atmosphere, and then those clouds will rain down liquid methane. And that rain will form streams that will eventually all lead back to the sea. So this one is on Miranda, which is one of Uranus's moons. And the idea here is that they're base jumping off of this cliff. And this is a huge cliff. Miranda has the tallest cliffs in the solar system. We can't get super precise readings, but we know that some of the cliffs on Miranda are at least five kilometers tall. It's like three miles tall. And also, it has relatively little gravity, so you're not going to fall that fast. So if you're not falling that fast, and you're falling so far, you could base jump off this thing and be falling for 12 minutes. And then, again, the gravity is so low that all you would need is some light thrusters to slow yourself down when you get to the, near the bottom and you could land on your feet and be totally fine. 
Oh, and also on your way down, you have this awesome view of Uranus yeah. and some of these yeah. other moons. Yeah. And then oh, this is the last awesome. scene. So it's on Saturn now. Rather than one of its moons, we're on Saturn, and you can see the rings, and this is the shadow of the planet on its rings here. What is very interesting about this scene is something seems a little off. What is she not wearing? Uh, pressurized space suit. A space suit. What three purposes do space suits serve? Pressure. Keep the outside Pressure. Out. Pressure. Very good. You guys got all of them. One is oxygen. It needs to provide you with breathable air. Yeah, that's yeah. Two is provide the right temperature. When you're out in space, the vast majority of places are going to be either way too hot or way too cold, so it keeps you at the right temperature. And the third one is pressurization. Like We need to be in pretty much one atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure here at the surface of Earth. If you get a much higher or lower in pressure, we are not going to survive that. If you were exposed to the vacuum of space, the total lack of pressure there would cause like your saliva and the water in your eyes to spontaneously boil, oh. and like the the gases that are dissolved in your um, blood would come out of solution, and you have bubbles form in your blood, and you die within seconds. Um, so, how can she not be wearing a spacesuit? Yeah, Saturn is a gas giant. So, when you're outside of Saturn, there's no pressure at all, but then as you go down through Saturn, eventually the pressure is going to be absolutely crushing. But at some point in that radiance, there's going to be one atmosphere of pressure. So if you can get your blimp, she's on a blimp here, and there's another one off in the distance here. If you can get your blimp to hang out at the level where there's one atmosphere of pressure, you wouldn't need a spacesuit for its pressure um, purposes. And so as long as you can keep warm enough, um, with other clothing and wear an oxygen mask for breathable air, you could just hang out without a spacesuit, which is exactly what she's doing. It's just so cold though. Yeah, it would be absolutely freezing. We'd need some clothes that are much warmer than anything we have. So, last thing we're going to do is watch the Wanderers video one last time now that you guys know everything that's going on.